Good evening, everybody. It's good to see each and every one of you here. We believe that you're well and you're strong and the grace of God continues to hover over our lives. This, um, this day, I just feel in my heart for us to move out of the familiarity of hearing the word of God. I would like to use Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 1 for us to begin. Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says to us, in the book of Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1, it says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my command within you. Let's just focus a little while on verse 1. The Bible says, my son, if you receive my word. The word receive there in the, in the Hebrew here means to take aggressively. You know? Many times the, uh, the English is insufficient to really tell us the essence of the word of God that's there. But this word here is my son, if you receive my word. So many of us, you know, uh, the, the posture of our heart, of our mind is that we need to be in a place that we want to grab the word of God we want to latch on to the word of God because it is God who is speaking to us through a man. And we're not just wanting the, the man of God. We want the God that is in the man that is coming through the word of God. So, you know, the first thing that we see is that we need to make sure, take it how you hear. The Bible says, Luke chapter 8, verse 18, take it how you hear. How you hear it will be measured back to you. So we find here that, you know, our heart must be in that place where we want to latch on to the word of God. Because if you latch on to the word of God, you latch on to God. So the first verse, it says receive. The word receive is very, very important. And how do you know it that you have received? It becomes a treasure. Proverbs chapter 2 verse 1, it says, if you receive my words and treasure my command. So firstly, it is, a, it is a treasure. It's something that is very, very precious. It's very valuable. The word of God is something of high value to your life. And how do you know it's high value? Because it's a command. Treasure my command within you. Where is this treasure? The treasure is inside. And this treasure will become a command, not a suggestion. Many of us, including our leaders, our pastors, and even myself sometimes, it's, a, it's like an option. You know, the word of God is almost like an option, but it's not an option. It is a command. And this is what we must pray today. Lord, I pray that we hear a command. We hear, we make sure, God, this word that is going to come into my heart, come into my life, come into my mind, oh God, it is a command. I must do it. It is not a suggestion, but I must make sure that it is a command from heaven. And if it is that, what will happen? You will incline, verse 2, you incline your ear to wisdom. This is what we have. We have a lot of knowledge. We have a lot of information. The, the internet is full of information, full of knowledge. But what, what do we want? You cannot find wisdom anywhere else except in the word of God that has become that, that has become a command, that has become a treasure. It is there you will find wisdom. It is there you'll find wisdom because you can incline your ear. That means you, you are so used. You're so used to to wisdom coming to you. It is very much like, you know, I'm sure you've experienced this before. Sometimes the, the ringtone of your phone, you know, rings in a public place and you think it's your phone because you're so inclined. You have listened to your ringtone again and again and again. And suddenly you find it's not your phone, it's somebody else's phone because you have trained your ear to the, to the ringtone of your phone, and it sounds like that, and suddenly you are you are awakened. Suddenly you 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 realize, oh, I have to take some action. I have to uh, let my hand move to my phone and answer the phone. So you incline your ear. There's an inclination. The inclination of your heart is to hear wisdom, and then even as you do that and apply your heart to under 
standing, understanding. This is where this is very important because every man is right in his own eyes. I pray today that you and I, in every aspect of our life, our measure and our standard is not our understanding, but it is the understanding of God and the word of God and the principles of God and the life of God, that that's the standard. That's the standard that must be in our life. At the moment, I find myself that in every aspect of my life, I have realized that I, I apply my own standards because that's what I understand. But now I understand that if I have the word of God as a standard, because the standard comes by understanding what God is saying to me, and because of that, I realize that what I understand is not what God wants me to understand. So if you apply your heart to understanding, yeah, and you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding. So the Bible says, lift up your voice. How many of us ask God for understanding? We don't trust in the Lord with all our heart. Lean not in your own understanding. The first challenge of the church is a challenge of understanding. One sermon if there are 60 people in the room, there will be 16 understanding. There will be 60 different understandings of that one sermon of teaching. Everybody understands it differently. That's why we don't have the power of one. And for years and years, we hear Papa keep on talking about, he keep on talking about equalization. You know, what is that word? What does it mean? That means we understand it like the way he understands it. You know, we put aside our understanding and we latch on to the understanding that is coming from our father, from the leader, that we understand it the way they understand it. And when this begins to happen, there will be such a place like an upper room that people were in one accord, in one place, in one accord because they were equalized. I pray today that we will be equalized as we hear the word of God, as we hear what God is speaking to us. I pray that it will be clear and clean and there will be a command. There will be wisdom. There will be understanding. All these things will come because our heart is a good ground and because we are making sure that when we receive these words in verse one, it is a treasure and it is a command. I pray, let us wait today as we hear for a treasure and a command. Hallelujah. May God bless the hearing of our word and the simplicity and the purity of our heart and a mind that will equalize in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. I pass the time over to Dr. Tunde Bakri. This afternoon, I'll be teaching on legacy planning and transfer. Mom, what time should I finish? Because you have an appointment at four. It doesn't matter. Okay, I will do my best. I don't, my joy is full. You know, I feel like doing some acrobatic dance. We have a lot to do together, Sarah. <laughs> you cannot escape out of here. <laughs> Legacy planning and transfer. In the year 2000, I reached out to my friend, Dr. Jonathan David. I said, the Lord has impressed upon my heart to take my family abroad. I want you to please pray so that I do not just decide on my own and get back to me whether I should take that step or not. Because there are so many people who relocate and ended up suffocating.
okay? There's so many stories of relocation in the Bible. Abraham relocated. He prospered. Huh? The great woman of Shunem relocated. He got seven years have his back. But when Elimelech relocated, he died in Moab. His sons died in Moab. And after 10 years, they heard, faith comes by hearing, they heard that there was bread in Bethlehem, Judah. After she heard it, I will now arise. Did they ask God before going? No. Some things could be avoided if we just ask God. Yeah. Oh, we know at the end of the day, God restored Moab, uh, 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 what's the name, root back into the family, blah, 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 blah. But did Boaz leave Bethlehem, Judah? If Boaz had left when Elimelech left, which field we root have to walk? What drove Elimelech out? Boaz stayed. Yeah. And guess who the mother of Boaz was? Ruth. No, 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 Ruth. Rahab. In order to remember the name, I had to say R R. <laughs> that shows you that age is catching up on me, but it's okay. Grace will take over. <laughs> Are you listening? So I called him. And after some three days, if you recall, he called me back. He said, the Lord showed me that like cheetah, that fastest animal, I saw you carrying your children to a place of safety and you brought them back home. So after he gave me the word, I sat my family down. I said, let us write a family constitution. I'm taking you abroad for 10 years and I'll be back after 10 years. And you would have finish or one of you remain in the university but once you finish your university education maximum two months you'll be back home because the Lord showed my friend that I took you away and I brought you back safely yeah. that's how all my children return after their degree yeah. Yeah. are you with me yeah. even at my stage I cannot afford to act on my own <laughs> because we are mosaic of one another you understand me and many people don't plan to have a legacy so what would they transfer what many people love is inheritance because you don't have to labor for that they inherit from you. And unfortunately, even parents work so hard to give inheritance to their children without showing them how they obtained what they are passing to them. Yeah. So this afternoon we we'll speak briefly and then in the days to come, we conclude. Legacy planning and transfer. Say that with me. Legacy planning. And transfer. and transfer. Say it again. Legacy, and One more time. Legacy, and so, what do you want to transfer? Is it inheritance or is it legacy? Can I put it in simple terms? Legacy is what produces inheritance. So if your children inherit and they don't have legacy, they don't know how to produce. They will end up consuming what you transfer to them and they will not be able to build on it. Are you listening? Okay. By way of simple definition, legacy planning and transfer is not just preparing our spiritual endowments, our graces, our gifting, and our wealth for others. Legacy planning and transfer is not just bequeathing or preparing our wealth, our spiritual endowment, our gifting, all that God has done in us through us. It's not just transferring it to those who will be beneficiaries of those things. Uh -huh. 
Legacy planning and transfer is about preparing others for spiritual endowment and gifting and wealth. That is to say, legacy planning is not giving things spiritual and now as you have gathered to others. It is doing in them what produce what you want to bequeath to them. It's not leaving things for others. It's living in others. Legacy transfer is not just what you leave for others. It is what you leave in them. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 14. First Timothy 4 14. Do not neglect. This was Paul talking to Timothy. Do not neglect the gift that is where? Uh, where was this gift? In you. How did he get it? Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Uh, who is the real elder here? Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 6. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 6. We are going to read together. Ready? Second Timothy chapter 1. Uh, it's not verse 6 I'm looking for. Is that verse 6? Oh, you made a mistake. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Ready? Read. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hand. Where was this gift? In Timothy. Legacy transfer is not living things for others. It's living things in them. So I've built some houses. If I want to wreck my children, I just dash them. That house is yours. That house is yours. That house is yours. I told them, for as long as I live in our corporation, our company, I have 30%. Your mom has 20%. Each of you, you have 10, 10, 10. You cannot vote us out. We cannot vote you out. We are joint heirs. But when I die, if I die, <laughs> I will leave my 30% for my wife. You cannot vote her out. She cannot vote you out. But none of those houses will be yours until you build yours. Because what happens is we raise our children, they finish their first degree, we buy a car, we buy a house, we buy everything for them, but they are not willing to lift a finger. So they have an entitlement mentality, and guess what? If you don't die quickly, they will pray for your exit. <laughs> So legacy transfer is not what you leave for people, it's what you leave in them. So that they too can rise and go beyond you and be hardworking and know how to produce and not just be a consumer. All right. Is it okay? Thank you. A little definition. I'll give brother an all-encompassing definition tomorrow by God's grace. God granting us life. I've learned to say that now. <laughs> because I died daily. <clears throat> Oxford Dictionary defines legacy, number one, as an amount of money or property left to someone in a will. That's what you read in Oxford Dictionary. An amount of money or property left to someone 
in a wheel. A second definition is a long lasting impact of particular events, actions that took place in the past or of a person's life. Let me break that down. Simply put, legacy is something that is passed on. It may take many forms. A legacy may be of one's faith, ethics, and core values. When my son was preaching some Sundays ago at the Lateran Assembly, he said that his grandmother, who happens to be my mother, said to them, don't forget me when I'm gone. Don't forget me when I'm gone. Don't forget me when I'm gone. And they asked mama, what do you mean by don't forget me? He said, everything I've taught your father, I expect him to teach you so that you retain them as your core values for life. Legacy may take the form of your character, your reputation, and the life you lead. Setting an example for others in order to guide their futures. Let me give you two clear examples. I pray that I'm able to finish what I've started today. But we still have two days to go, right? We have tomorrow and we have Monday. By God's grace, we must finish. Okay. Now, listen to this. What did God say about Abraham when he visited him in his tent? He said, I know Abraham that he will command his children and members of his household to fear the Lord and to do justice on the earth so that God will do what he has promised to do for Abraham. So it was a promise with condition. It was a condition that Abraham we command. It's, that's not shouting, come here, sit down. No, his lifestyle that they will see will make them behave like him. The legacy of Abraham is faith. That's why he's called the father of faith and the friend of God. Now for some time, the king Jehoshaphat said, Abraham, the friend of God forever. He will command his children and his household to fear the Lord. So as Abraham was living before them, do you know how old he died? It was 175 years. Why? Because Jacob must grow under his influence. Jacob was 15 when Abraham died at 175. Isaac was 60 when he gave back to Jacob. So Jacob must pass the bar mitzvah so that the grandfather who taught the values to the son will also teach the value to the grandson why? Because forever, this is what God said, it shall be called the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This is my name forever to every generation. Do you understand? So Abraham lived that life that made Isaac do what he did and Jacob what he did. When Jacob was in the house of Laban, and they were changing his wages 10 times. He said, the fear of my father Isaac kept me from violating the ground rules. What is that fear of my father? You read it in the medical and say, fear of God. It was in them. Now, Abraham and Lot were members of the same family. God was going to burn down Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes. And Abraham began to intercede. How many people did they conclude over? Ten. If I can find ten righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, I will not burn it down. Was Lot a believer? Huh? Why are you not answering? 
I desire to make this very interactive. I'm not even gotten to the interactive. I have five questions for you. I may read it, you go and answer, and we mark your script. If you don't pass well, you start from kindergarten of Isaac Network. <laughs> Was Lot a believer? The Bible says in the book of Peter, that that righteous man's soul was vexed daily. He was a righteous man. But was he effective? When angels came to the camp, to the tent of Abraham, what did he do? Oh my Lord, you have come on a good day. Please let me wash your feet so that you can sit down. I'll quickly prepare food for you to eat. And God sat down and ate man's food. You know what I call it? Down payment for the manna. Because man is going to eat angel's food. Amen. And if you don't draw near to him, he cannot draw nigh to you. Okay? Are you listening to me? When, Ab when the angels got two angels, God departed after the intercession with Abraham. When the angels got to Lord's tent, it was a house now. He had built a house. He had become comfortable. He was no longer dwelling in tents. He was a rich man. He was rich in Sodom. Built a house that was soon be consumed with fire. Yeah. <laughs> he saw the angels. He ran to us. You have come. Let me wash your feet. And let me set food before you. The same protocol that he learned from Abraham. He extended Abraham entertained angels unaware. And he began to entertain angels unaware, following the same protocol. Wash their feet, set food before them, they ate. And he said, come into my house. We are not coming to your house. We are going to consume this. What kind of lifestyle did he live? How was Moab conceived? And how was Ammon conceived? The two daughters of Lot got their father drunk. The first one slept with him and conceived and gave birth to Moab. The second daughter got him drunk and conceived by him and gave birth to Ammon. Yes? The Lord command his household and children. Backtrack. How many people did God say if he will find they will not burn the city? Ten. Did he find ten? Even ordinary, simple calculation. This will at least be ten. Lot. Say one. Mrs. Lot. The two daughters. The two husbands. The parents of the two husbands. The first husband and the second husband. They will have father and mother. That would be, God did not get ten. Mm. How about the staff that caused strife between Abraham's tribe? Were there no staff? Yeah. There should have been more than ten in the household of Lord, but he did not do evangelism. He was not effective in witnessing. He was not extending his faith to others. He was just vexed daily. When he saw the conversation of the wicked. But do you understand what I'm trying to say? That homosexuality is not our problem. Gay culture is not our problem. Our problem is God is not finding what he's looking for. Because if God found righteous people there, he will not destroy it. God consumed Sodom and Gomorrah because of what he did not find. So what are you doing in your city? Do you know God lowered the standard when he came to Jerusalem? God was not looking for 10 people in Jerusalem. He was looking for one man and he didn't find. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 1. You know you have a responsibility to God, towards God in your city. God is going to old Apostle Trevor Banks for Florida. Hold you responsible. Whether it's Indonesia or uh, where, Singapore, where God is going to hold you responsible. 
God must be able to say, in every generation I must have a witness. He must be able to tell the devil, you know what? I have traveled there. I'm okay. I have been at there. We heard the chain of command today. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the angel of the church. Amen. Do you understand me? This is the command that must not be broken. How effective are you in reaching out your city and being the spokesperson for God in your city? Yeah. How effective are you as the salt of the earth and the light of the world? A city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Or all you are enjoying is a wonderful celebrate Jesus every Sunday. All right. Legacy may be monetary on your assets. It may come from your character. Have you noticed what I said? That God looked in Jerusalem. He didn't find one man. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 1. Write it down and read it yourself. He said go to and fro Jerusalem. If you can find a man. One man that is righteous. That is doing justice. I will forgive her. He did not find. He looked for 10 in Sodom and Gomorrah. He did not find. He said, okay, let me go to my people. At least I'll find one person. He did not find. What is the essence of coming here year after year, traveling miles, paying resources, coming to land, if there's no change in your territory, you don't have a good legacy. Right, I said this would be interactive. How long do you give me? Four one. Hmm? Four one. Four to four fifty. You are changing. <laughs> you said four. You said four thirty. You said four to four fifteen. Which one? <laughs> okay, for the sake of my friend, we stop at four. Is that okay? Yes. Is that fine? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. We'll continue from tomorrow. Five questions. This is our interactive session. You must participate. Yes. The church should stop this idea of sit still as I instill. They asked Jesus questions he answered. And he asked them questions that they could not answer. How many questions did he ask in the New Testament? Three you see, he knows all the questions. He said, Jesus asked 308 questions in the New Testament. Let me write it down so I can quote it somewhere. I didn't know that. Because I didn't count his questions one by one. You must have gone to theological school. <laughs> you read it in a book. You Google it. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, you see why our children no longer listen to our instruction? Before you talk to them, they are Googling and saying, Daddy, Google did not say so. <laughs> it's called parenting by outsourcing. Are you ready? First question. How many of you in this strategic conference are ready for legacy transfer? Yesterday, we said this is a strategy conference. We must have goals. We must have action plan to attain the goals. And we must mobilize resources to back the action plan. Yes or no? Yes. So how many of us in this strategy conference are prepared for legacy transfer? I can't see any hand up. So we have wasted time. How many of you? One, two, three, four. You see human beings? Immediately two people will lift up the rest and say, okay, me too, me too. <laughs> All right. I'm asking three questions under this first question. The second question, which is part of number one, are you all aware of what it takes 
to receive legacy transfer. Are you all aware of what it takes to receive legacy transfer? Let me pause here and inject what will look like a time bomb. I will not release it, but I'll put it there. When God said, I know or have known Abraham, he said, we'll command who? His children. And then his household. That includes his servants. To fear the Lord, right? So his children must include their mother. Yes or no? His household must include Eliezer. Yes or no? And the 318 soldiers that fought to recover Lord from captivity. Yes or no? So the people in the household of Abraham will be about 400 people. Plus or minus. Yes or no? All right. Okay, good. Who did Abraham transfer his legacy to? Huh? Huh? Mom had answered me, he said Isaac. Because he gave gifts to the sons of the concubines and sent them far away to the east so that they would not disturb. Isaac and he gave all to Isaac so what does it take for you to receive legacy transfer we are now facing the truth okay I will ask a third question. Under question one, is legacy transfer automatic because you live in the house? <laughs> Nobody answered my question. No. It's not automatic. Okay. As members of Isaac Network, are you entitled to legacy transfer from your father? In his good heart, he had been transferring since we got here. But yeah. many of you didn't hear. Yeah. In his good heart, he had been doing so. But sorry, sir. As much as you desire to pump it all out, not all we receive. Yeah. It depends on who you are. And how you have nurtured the relationship between you and your father. And how you have prioritized things that are important. He told you repeatedly this morning, don't bring those unnecessary. He, he, he called them, he gave them a name. Oh, 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 so you know. You know all the non-essentials you have added. I told you yesterday we are so programmatic. We go from program to program instead of from glory to glory. All right, let me go to question number two. If that's all I can do today, I will stop at four. Are you ready for question number two? Is it possible for a person who wants qualified to miss out on legacy transfer? Do you know he taught you, but you didn't hear? 
is spend quality time on the prodigal son today. But most especially on the prodigal son's older brother. Who had a small goat mentality. He even said, he said, he even has friends. I said, I was listening and capturing all that he was saying. You have not given me even a little goat to celebrate with my friends. But this your son collected your inheritance and wasted it on prostitutes. Did he catch him on a woman? That was his own thoughts that he projected to his younger brother. Which one do you prefer of the two? Rabbinat, which of the two sons would you prefer? You don't want either. You see? You see? Okay, call me any name that you like. If I have opportunity to choose one, I'll choose the prodigal son. Why? He knew how to demand for his rights. Number two, he knew how to share with others. Number three, when he had wasted all his resources, he knew how to go look for work. Number four, when things were not going well, he did not wait for an evangelist. He spoke to himself. He said, I'm going back home. I'll be treated better at home. I'm returning home. Even if I will be a servant in my father's house. But the older brother is a complainer, is a murmurer, is a workaholic. Did not know how to demand for what was his right. The father said, all that I have is yours, but you never asked. And the only fatted calf in the family I've killed for your brother. Your brother is inside, you are now outside. Sorry, home. Is it possible for a person once qualified for legacy transfer to miss out on it? Okay, this is where I'm going to stop because this second question is too loaded. It's by asking those questions that your eye of understanding will open as to the process that God takes us through. Was Esau the son of Jacob? Was he the firstborn? Was he entitled to legacy transfer? Did he get it? Why not? Let's quickly read. Genesis 27 <laughs> Verse 1 to 4. Genesis 27, 1 to 4. Okay. Now it came to pass. Oh, ho. <laughs> How many things have come to pass in your life? <laughs> now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau his older son and said to him, My son. And he answered him, here I am. Then he said, behold, now I'm old. I do not know the day of my death. Now, therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow and go out to the field and hunt game for me. Verse 4. And make me savory food such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless you before I die. Hello. What was Jacob trying to do? To transfer legacy to his son. To his first son. Is that a good intention? Did it happen that way? Why not? It did not happen because Rebecca knew 
that the moment such transfer is done in the presence of God, that was the end. Did you see God in what Esau said? I mean, Jacob said. No, no, no. Isaac. Did God say in the presence of God? Did he mention it? But Rebecca knew that when such things are about to take place, God is present. That all that you are hearing about legacy transfer is because God truly wants to bless some of you. And many times we are not ready. Yes. Why? Because we have despised our birthright. <laughs> Two, because there was a prophecy before they were born. Yes. And it was Rebecca who knew about that prophecy. There was struggle in the womb. What is this struggle for? There are two manner of people in your womb. Two nations you are carrying. The older will serve the younger. So he had laid, she had laid hold of that prophecy and was waiting to intercept so that Esau would not get what he thought he was going to get. You know, this is a whole lot of things. And if you don't understand God, you will think, how can God do this? Did God force Esau to sell his birthright? No. Huh? No. Huh? No. But do you know God spoke before they did anything, whether good or bad? That Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, when they have done nothing. Why will God do such a thing? Sovereignty! The sovereign God knew the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end, and the ways in between. Yeah. And he knew the core character of Esau. Yeah. That no matter the correction you bring to his life, he will not listen. Yeah. I'll leave that to tomorrow. Make sure you come. Yeah. Don't run away. Yeah. Come and hear. So that you not blame anyone for any blunder. Why did Rebecca spring into action? He knew the moment Isaac would pronounce blessing in the presence of God, that was the end. But the presence of God is not mentioned. Let's read further. Genesis 20, what did we first read? Uh -huh. 5 to 10. Now Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, right? <laughs> and Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebecca spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make every food for me that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the huh? that I may bless you in the presence of the Lord before my did Isaac say so? <laughs> How did she know? Because she knows when a father stands. To pronounce blessings upon the children. Yeah. The God of the Father is there. Right. To ensure those things come to pass. That's right. That's right. When you hear legacy transfer. Are you conscious of his presence? Amen. I will continue from here tomorrow but before I go I'll read just one verse of scripture and pray for you and I want you to meditate on it all night long I'm very serious by the grace of God we will not labor in vain 
you become the seal of our apostleship. That when men will see you long after we have gone, they will know that we did not labor in vain. Give me Proverbs chapter 9 and I will pray. Rebecca was conscious that there will not be transfer except God was there to execute it. Because once the man dies, that's the end. You can go and contest the will. You can go and fight. You can go and do what you like. But when the presence of God is there, there's nothing you can do to change it. He will ensure that what the Father pronounced will come to pass. It is tomorrow that I will show you that the, the best cloth that Jacob was wearing that day was a choice cloth of Esau. He took this choice garment of Esau and put it on Jacob and he drew him near and he said the smell of the garment of my son is like the field with the Lord has blessed but the owner of the garment did not know Esau did not know Esau was busy looking for blessing <laughs> give me Proverbs 9 I want to close I have three minutes to four. <laughs> Wisdom has done what? Wisdom is about to build. Huh? It's about to build. Or has built. I can't hear you. Wisdom has built a house. She has hewn out a Seven pillars. How many pillars does a house of wisdom have? I can't hear you. She has all out her seven pillars. Next verse. She has slaughtered her meat. She has mixed her wine. She has also furnished her table. She has sent out her maidens. She cries out from the highest places of the city. Whoever is simple, that means teachable, meek, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine I have mixed. Forsake foolishness, and leave, and go in the way of understanding. He said, forget about foolishness. Come to me. I've slaughtered my meat. I've mixed my wine. Everything is ready. Come over here. Stop being foolish. How many pillars are in the house of wisdom? Seven. What are these seven pillars? If you don't know what they are, how do you access them? Because each pillar is very significant for you to access the multi dimension wisdom of God. Can I quickly give you the seven pillars? Yes. Are you ready? Yes. The first pillar. The presence of God. When he was arranging sovereignty, spontaneity, uh, simultaneous, he said, This is not theology of S, neither is this theology of P. But I want to give you these seven pillars. Are you ready? Yes. The first pillar is the presence of God. The presence of God commands the miraculous. In the presence of God is the fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures evermore. So the first P is the presence of God. Is that okay? Yes. The second pillar. Are you ready? Yes. Is the peace of God. The peace of God that passes all understanding. That will stop you from having anxiety over anything. The God of peace, when he comes into you, he will crush Satan under your feet. Not only that, the peace of God will not make sense to people around you. It doesn't make sense for a doctor to come for these meetings. He could stay at home and say, guys, greet them that I'm not feeling too well. But he's well now. <laughs> Me, he's well. What's the first pillar? Presence. What's the second pillar? Peace of God. Are you, are you okay? Yes. Do you find that in your Bible? Yes. What's the third pillar? The power of God. 
the power of God. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Tarry ye in Jerusalem. Once you receive the promise of the Father, it's only when the power comes that you can tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Say with me. Presence. Presence. Peace. Peace. Power. power. When you have the presence and the peace and the power in your life, provision shows up. Amen. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Is a provider. Is a great provider. Do you understand me? Say with me. Presence, Presence. Peace, peace, power, power. Provision. provision. How about protection? Amen. How about protection? He that dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my shield, He is my fortress. He is, do you understand me? The protection of God. If God is protecting all that you have, Satan can go to and fro. He will build an edge around you. He cannot invade your territory. How many do you have? Name them. Presence. Peace. Provision. Protection. When you have solid protection, promotion does not come from the east or from the west or from the south. It comes from God. You have promotion. It will be your season of elevation. God will be promoting you. I sat at home a few days back and one of the most popular universities on the cutting edge, perhaps the best in our country, wrote to me, we are going to give you a doctorate degree in law. Honoris Causa, I didn't seek for it. I didn't look for it. And they are asking me to come in order to receive it. You do not look for honor. Honor looks for you. Do you understand me? Some will despise you, but you know what? If God is elevating you and promoting you, there's nothing anyone can do. If the brothers of Joseph had been smart, I told you this yesterday, if they had been smart, they should be jumping when they had the second dream. He said, I saw 11 stars bow to me. Bow was the only thing they heard. They didn't know they would become stars. If they knew that by virtue of their brother, they were going to become stars, they would be saying, what can we, how can we help you? Amen. They sold them into slavery and catapulted them into power and they all bowed without being stars until he began to help them. <laughs> how many pieces do you have now? Peace. One. Peace. Two. Peace. Three. Power. Four. Five, six, when all this jam in your life, when you have the peace, you have the presence, you have the peace, you have the power, you have the provision, you have the protection, you have the promotion. When the jam in your life, what do you think will follow? Praise. The praise of God will never depart from your mouth. You praise him in the morning. You praise him in the evening. You praise him at noon. No matter what is happening, you just keep on praising God. But it all begins with the presence. Amen. Rebecca knew. Yes. Once this blessing is released in the presence of God, you can't reverse it. And that's why anybody fighting Israel is wasting his time. Stand to your feet. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are leaving this place as carriers of your presence. None of us will miss out of this legacy transfer. Thank you for the father you have given to this house. He will leave. He will see. He will declare the mighty works of God. He will see his sons and daughters answer for him at the gate. Yes. He has not and will not labor in vain. Yes. He will not bring forth for trouble. Yes. Isaac Network will continue to mount wings. Yes. They will go from glory to glory. Yes. Because the transfer that will be theirs as a result of this legacy transfer, they will have proof for their faith. Yes. Thank you for answers coming from your presence. Yes. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Yes. Amen.
Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God for the word today. You know, this is a very, very pivotal word because our understanding of legacy transfer has many versions. Okay. Some versions are, okay, I've signed the form. I'm part of Isaac, so there is legacy transfer. Some versions are, you know, I want to build a church in the same color of carpet that Papa has. You know, I preach the same sermon. I teach the same teaching. But it is clear to us that legacy is not what you give to them. It's what you put in them. And what is it that, what is the ingredient? Let's look at 1 Chronicles 28 and 9 and understand clearly legacy transfer. David is telling Solomon, he says, for you to continue in posterity for legacy transfer, he explains to him, he says in verse 9, at the closing of his life, this is a dead man is speaking and the, the words of people that are going to leave the earth are very important. And instead of him telling him about how to get riches and how to do all things, he explains to him that what is in me must be in you. And so David explains to him and he said, as for you, my son Solomon, 1 Chronicles 28, 9, 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 9, he says, as for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father. Know the God of your father. What does that mean? The same God that has brought me, processed me, that has made me, has shaped me, has, has made, has, has processed in such a way that there is no ambition. There's no uh, want for money, position. You know, we can say, oh, I, I, I know God. Yeah. But the way that David knew God is that if, if, if God had a desire, he would be able to pick it up. He said, I want to build God a house. And Nathan said, I didn't I did not tell David, but David can pick up the frequencies, can pick up the vibrations. God does not even have to tell him, but he is so close to God that he is able to do that. And then in verse chapter 29, he says, I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God. Imagine he was not going to build it. You know. But God said to him, you are not the one who's going to build it. He didn't re re uh, rebel, rebel. He did not, you know, throw a fist. He said, okay, God, whatever it is. So this whole aspect of how did God shape our father, the hand of God, the dying, the death that happened in them must happen in us. I know the, the, know the God of your father, serve him with a loyal heart and a willing mind. This is what must be in us. When, you, when we listen to what Pastor B is sharing with us, this is what must be inside of us. It's what you put in them. It's not what you give them, as he has said to us. And that's why I believe this is so important. Have a willing mind for the Lord searches all hearts, understand all the intent. Intention must be pure. Intention is not to expand ministry. We are not coming to more to receive more and more information and, and notes to preach and and all kinds of things that are, that is that has been happening that's there on the ground you know and uh, that's why it's important i remember one time you know uh myself and somebody else began to ask ask papa i said papa what is it that we can do what is it we can do for you he said nothing and then we ask again so what is it that we can really do for you? He said, nothing. He said, all I need is a dose of the presence of God in my life every day. What was he saying? He was saying that this is the deepest desire that you must have, that I have. The presence that changes your life. That's the thing that you must have, that I have that must continue to be your food and your water and your drink. And that's what he was saying to us. We didn't understand like the disciples, we went away and we discussed it and we are wondering what is this, what is he talking about? And, you know, but as God began to give us understanding, we understood 
that the same God that he is, that's working in him must work in us to make sure that the reality of the presence of God is the most important thing in our lives. And this is how we find that as Pastor B begins to share with us, you know, about the planning of legacy transfer. Why is it that the reality of the presence of God is number one? It is number one because, because this is the factor that made Joseph successful as a prisoner. You know, the Bible says that Joseph was a successful man because the Lord was with him. The presence of God was with him. He was prosperous, the Bible says. And prosperity is not money. Prosperity is the reality of the presence of God. So I pray that we, we re-look at legacy transfer, make sure it's proper, make sure that we are not, every man is right in his own eyes, but let this word go deeper and deeper by the grace of God for my life, for your life, and for everybody, so that we, bring, we, we will bring glory to God. Amen. I pray today has been helpful. I pray today the adjustment is necessary and adjustment will be for us little by little, by little day by day. God bless you and your family. I pray that this week will be such a week that we begin to study 1 Samuel 28 and verse 9 and understand legacy is what is in you. It's not what you have received on the external, but the God that has shaped our Father must shape our life. Amen. See you at the top. See you in the presence of God. Let the reality of God continue upon you and your family. As Papa says, change by his presence, change into his likeness. God bless you.
天。